Hello and welcome to this episode of the AI Show. Wow, that's loud. Oh, I got to turn that down. Blew your ears out. How's it going, everybody? My name is Seth Juarez, and I'm excited to be here on this episode of the AI Show. As we get ready to start, where's everybody coming from? I'd love to say hello to each of you. Last week, we had people from everywhere. It was fantastic. <laughs> My sound effects are so dumb. But it's okay. It's okay. So listen, today... Today, my wife's out of town, and so I got to walk my dude over to his bus stop, which happens to happen right in the middle of our show. We're talking about what's latest in Azure Form Recognizer. By the way, um, let me let me share my screen here. Uh, it's time for our pandemic purchase utilization. The only time I use... Uh, the only time I use this thing, obviously... Boom. Today, like I was saying, I got to take my, my dude to, to his bus stop. But that's okay because it's all going to work out because we're going to be talking. Man, did this turn off? My goodness. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Number one form recognizer with Vinod. Hopefully he'll come today so that you can ask him questions. But we uh, we actually talked about this stuff last time. I'll, I'll play the recording. But it's all new stuff. So whenever we show a recording on the AI show, it's new. Brand a spanking anew in that we recorded it and no one else has seen it until you have. So um, I just want you to know that. Form recognizer with Vinod. We'll do a little bit of that. And then number two, number two, we'll get back to work on our project, but we may have a special guest here in addition to Vinod. Uh, because like I said, I got while I'm playing the thing we just recorded that's brand new, uh, new form recognizer stuff, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, I'm going to walk my son over to the bus stop. It's going to work out if it doesn't. I don't know. We're just going to stare at each other awkwardly. Or, or, I have a friend here who may help out. So, thank you for being here, friend. It's Cassie. I, I gave it away. She's awesome. You, you've seen her on the show. She's my co hostess with the mostest. Um, so, yeah, uh, about that. So, we'll, we'll continue to work on our, our project, Rochambeau. I had an idea that I wanted to explore to see if we could make it work. Here, let me show you what that idea is. Um, and then, hold, I wanna get Cassie on here to see what she thinks. Hold on, Cassie, hold on, Cassie. While this show, th hey Cassie, how are you? Good, happy Monday. I wanted to run this by you to see what you thought because okay. YOLO V9 is out, right? Mm-hmm. YOLO V9 is out and I thought because it's the Rochambeau thing and I wanted to be more accurate. What if, now look at, the, you tell me if you think this is stupid. I don't know why I'm moving it here. I should move this here. What if, what if, because all we need to do is rock, paper, scissors or none, rock, paper, scissors or none, mm -hmm. easy. But what if we made the model such that the base was YOLO V9? Okay. Right, out comes that huge, uh, that huge, you know, vector, it's like a big, huge tensor that has like all of the, you know, gases. And then it does, you know, an intersection over union kind of crap. But what if instead we put on there like maybe a couple of convolutions that's convoluting over this space into some multi-layer perceptron and then out into rock, paper, or scissors? Would this model be smarter? What do you think? I would have to test it. I'm not really sure. I could. Like, I've played with YOLO V9 a little bit. And for object detection, one thing I noticed is it's not good at recognizing. It obviously doesn't recognize anything it doesn't know. So that's why you'd have to do the additional layers to so it would understand that. Because I'm assuming those aren't, you know, existing layers in the model no. or existing labels. So, so it would be like, but, it would be like, like, I'm going to just like, mm -hmm. I'm going to see 
here, let me change the color because I obviously, I mean, we're all here together. We might as well. I am not going to tell it. And this is the part that I think I think I wanted to get your thoughts on because I'm not going to tell it about any of its like, um, I'm not going to tell it about anything. I am just going to hope that the forward backward oh. thing will force it to learn the right places. Interesting. So I'm not labeling, I'm not labeling like, I'm not like here's Seth, right? And then yeah. here's his hand and I'm not labeling this box. I'm just going to give it the images and pass it through. I don't know. Like, what it do you think? An interesting would, test. would that work? I, I don't know. I, don't, I honestly don't know without testing it. I, I would like to play around with things to see how they work. That's kind of how I and understand. Like, but when I was testing it, if it didn't recognize something it wasn't trained on, it didn't it didn't recognize it at all. So no, yeah, no, it would never do that. And, and so I'm thinking, I'm thinking though that I create this huge function because I mean, you know that I, you better than anyone. I'm not going to mansplain to you. You wrote the articles on PyTorch. It's just some huge function. Mm -hmm. that then we optimize. So if we just force that in there and then the thing that we're doing, let's just say we're doing cross entropy loss, cross entropy loss, right? The cross entropy loss would be over these four things. And I would be interested to see what it learns here or if it even works. But am I, am I trying to kill a fly with a shotgun? I guess is the question. Well, I mean, I think for fun's sake, you should definitely try it just because it sounds sake, like, of course. right? Of course. So like, who cares? <laughs> for but funsies. from like a model size perspective, um, is it running, isn't it running on device? It's running on the back end in Azure ML. I was going to try oh, to get it. To, I was trying to get it to, I was going to try to get it to work on the front end uh, using like Onyx runtime in the JavaScript. How big, yeah. how big, how big is YOLO V9? Hi, YOLO. Hello. So I think if you're running it in Azure, then like, why not? But then you could also have a smaller model that runs locally and use the the hybrid extension to switch between them based on accuracy as well. So you could do both. I see. You don't have to I see. That's true. That's true. So it'd be interesting because I think the other model you're using was much smaller. Um, I was using a ResNet 50. Oh, okay. So which was kind of too much. Yeah. Wasn't it? Yeah, I think so. You could do something smaller like mobile net for local on device inferencing, right? Yeah. I thought that's what you were using originally. Did you change? I yeah, because it wasn't very good. It wasn't very okay. good. But to be fair, I only trained it on like 300 images of my goofy face. Okay. Um, yeah. I, I don't is know. Is there smaller versions of the new? Like, is there different sizes okay. um, available for the new YOLO model? How big is YOLO V9? It doesn't even freaking, I'll just, you know what? Screw it. We're, we're going to ask, we're going to ask the AI. We're going <laughs> to ask the AI. Bing, here we go. Yeah. Here we go. How big is YOLO V9? Tell on your brethren. <laughs> Tell well, see, but on... wasn't it trained as of like 2021? So, or 2022 data? So it might not know. Or is it able to take in the context of search results and then put yeah, that yeah, in that's there? what it's doing. So the way okay. that this thing works is it input size. Who cares about the input size? Huh? Doesn't know. So Ooh. if you send it in the doc, try sending it in the documentation link and then see. What there is no YOLO v nine documentation. Is oh, there, there isn't. The only thing I found was. I wonder if I played with YOLO V8, if that's what I'm think, thinking of. I, yeah, I think I was playing with YOLO V8 last time. There's a README. A new state of the art computer vision model. You know, the guy that worked on this stopped working on it because he thought it was, he, he thought it wasn't good to do it. Like and good so, performance or good? No, ethically. Oh, ethically, okay. Yeah, so he stopped working on it. Um. Okay, let me ask it. What about and then somebody else picked up then where he left? Yeah, out? what about YOLO V8? What do we got going on? Fairly certain I have that one locally. Let me see. Of course you would. That's why I asked you. <laughs> let 
I couldn't find the exact dimension of the V8. However, I found that Yolo V8 is designed to be fast, accurate, and easy to use, making it an excellent choice for a wide range of body bag. It can be trained on large data sets and capable of running on a variety of hardware platforms, CPU, GPU. Yeah, I know that. Hmm. What's the difference between Yolo V8 and Yolo V9? Maybe it can help us. We're trying to make the AI tell. Oh, shoot. I got to start our show here real quick. Um, okay. Yolo V8 is built on the Yolo V5 for several architectural and developer experience improvements. It is faster marketing than Yolo V5, and it provides a unified framework for training models for performing object detection. Yet. Yolo V9 is not yet released, so there's no comparison. Okay. I don't know if this is true, though. Let's. Where's number two? I mean, this is helpful that it can. This picture is delightful. Have you seen this picture? I have not. This is delightful. Oh yeah, look at it. Yeah, this look at the way that I've never seen convolutions uh, uh, drawn that way. That's perfect. Wow. Hmm. I kind of just want this picture. All right. Well. Uh, okay, so Yolo V8, when I was testing it, I was running it on a Raspberry Pi, which only has like it doesn't have that much memory. And it worked. So I think that from a size perspective, there's probably a version you could use at least for the V8. It was a little slow on my Raspberry Pi, but for a browser, I think it'd be fine. Yeah. So I would assume that means V9 is Faster. probably around similar. Unless oh, it's like I love this picture so much. Look at this. I am this is just a is there like a PDF of this? Sweet baby Thor. I mean, look at this. <laughs> this is beautiful. Look at it. it has the it has the the way that it computes the anchor boxes. Oh man, look at this beauty beauty. I don't know. Maybe I it's like only two people in the world would look at this and be like, this is beautiful, and you're the other one. So uh, weirdo. That's all I can say. Yeah. Okay. It oh looks rough, I think, right? I don't know. I know. I tell myself. <laughs> All right. Well, um, as we get going, today we're supposed to talk about this thing, the latest model updates in Azure Form Recognizer. So what I'm going to do is Vinod is, should be here soon. Hopefully it'll be here after so he can answer questions. Um, oh, and I didn't see where everyone was from. Oh, Janice Crew number seven is here, Avi. Vladimir, welcome. Cabrera. Wow, that's like a... Russian name and a Spanish last name. How delightful is that? Uh, Cassie's here. That's cool. Mm -hmm. I haven't talked to her in a long time. Uh, so welcome, everyone. So before we get started, uh, we're going to talk about what's the latest in Azure Form Recognizer with Vinod Kurpod. Let's see what he has to say starting now. You're not going to want to miss this episode of the AI Show, where we talk all about the latest model updates in Azure Form Recognizer with my friend Vinod Kurpod. Make sure you tune in. Hello and welcome to this episode of the AI Show, where we're talking all about the latest model updates in Azure Form Recognizer with my friend Vinod Kurpad. Vinod, I haven't seen you in a while. How are you doing, my friend? I'm doing great, Seth. How are you? Fantastic. So for those who do not know you, could you introduce yourself? Yes, I'm Vinod Kurpad. I'm a product manager on the Azure uh, Applied AI team working on Form Recognizer. Fantastic. So for those that don't know what Azure Form Recognizer is, can you give us the deets? Yes, thank you. So Form Recognizer is a uh, applied AI service intended for your document understanding solutions. So customers that have a lot of document processing workflows typically you know, run through some, some amount of document automation uh, where they have to extract values from documents and then process those in a downstream application. And that's essentially the, the core purpose of what Form Recognizer does. It helps you extract values from your documents and then use those extracted values in your downstream application processing needs. That's fantastic. So from paper, basically, into structured computer stuff. Exactly. So so it's a combination of a, two different things. It's a, it's a combination of obviously extracting text from paper, but also extracting structure and inferring structure from, from documents, and then using that structure to then define what is your, your downstream application, that, that how, how it can consume that information. That's amazing. And it works with any kind of documents? I mean, can you give us a sense for what kind of documents it can work with? Yeah, so Swarm Recognizer can work with any types of document, right? You have essentially three three categories of models that we have. Uh, the first is read, which is essentially OCR, so it extracts content from documents. So we typically work with PDF files, TIFF images, PNGs, um, and read can now even work with Office documents in, in preview. So there are a certain amount of uh, customers that need just content extraction, and read is, is a perfect solution for them. 
for customers that actually need a little bit more. So we have uh, another set of APIs that are general document APIs or document type agnostic APIs. And these typically are layout as well as the general document model. And layout and the general document model extract both text as well as structure. So structure could be things like tables uh, or it could be selection marks. Those are just examples of structure that, that you can extract out of the, the document with layout. The general document model includes key value pairs, which is essentially uh, think of it as uh, any key value pair within a document. So you might have a form that has first name and last name. Uh, so you, you you extract those as as key value pairs, and this can work with any form, any document. It's it just works out of the box without any training required. That's pretty cool. Now here's a here's a question, and I, I did I wasn't sure of this, but does it work with like if someone like hand wrote on a form? Does that work too? Absolutely, we can do handwritten text recognition as well, and uh, you know, handwritten text comes out as as text extracted, but we also recognize that it is handwritten text, and we give you a little bit of a of a clue that it's handwritten text through the uh, the, the styles output. So, so you can go look for text that you know is handwritten by looking for for the output of the API that has a style of handwritten text. This is this is amazing stuff. Obviously, if you haven't heard of it, you should go take a look at it. But now let's talk about the new new stuff. What's new? in Azure Form Recognizer. All right, there's obviously a lot to talk about here because there's there's a lot of new stuff in Azure Form Recognizer. So we'll start with document classification, right? A common challenge when dealing with a lot of different documents uh, is the fact that you need to understand which type of document you're dealing with before you can process it effectively downstream. And so in the past, we've had a, a capability called Model Compose, which allowed you to compose different models together and then when you submitted a document for analysis to Model Compose, it would pick the right underlying model to use to extract the values. We're now coming out with a new document classification API that allows you to train a classifier uh, that, that can then disambiguate between the different types of documents you're working with. I, that's really cool because, I mean, I was thinking of, okay, I'll give it all my one forms and then it'll process, and then I'll yeah. give it all my other forms and then it process. Now you're saying you can just give it forms and it will disambiguate between the different types and then do that other processing read layout and key value pairs oh yeah yeah it, it can do that but I'll, I'll give you one one more step right so it does Ooh. one more thing which is essentially splitting a document right uh so i'm going to purposely choose to use two different uh words here i'm going to use a file which would sort of de denote a file right so think of a scenario where you might want to do a loan application, right? So your loan processor asks you to say, hey, Seth, go ahead and upload your, uh, maybe a copy of your bank statement, a copy of your recent YouTube and a, a loan application form filled out, right? You scan these things, upload it, it goes in as a single file, but it's actually a combination of three separate documents. And so with the new classification API, we can identify what are the different classes of documents contained within a single file and give you those page ranges. So then you can process them appropriately as needed as well. Oh, I see. So it's even more than just like sorting through papers. It's sorting through a single quote unquote document that I've scanned in and it's able to separate and disambiguate even in the same file. Exactly. Right. So, so it's, it's taking a single file and then chunking that up into individual documents. That's awesome. Any other new things? Because I feel like I want to, I want to see this stuff in action. Oh yeah. So, so we're only getting started with this, right? So, so the other new things that we want to talk about is uh, what we're doing with uh, OpenAI and using OpenAI's models uh, as a, a, with Azure OpenAI, we're now got a zero shot extraction capability called query fields. So you can, uh, so there are scenarios, for example, the general document model extracts key value pairs, right? Um, and you might find yourself in a scenario where it extracts 90% of the things that you need, but there's these two or three other fields that are really core to your business that maybe uh, the model doesn't really extract. Uh, so you can use the query fields feature to give the model a hint and say, hey, I'm really interested in this particular uh, value that, that should be presented in these documents. Can you find that for me? And that's what the query fields does. So it's, it, it's, it takes a hint from you in terms of what the field is that you might be looking for and then uses OpenAI's technologies uh, be behind the scenes to then extract the right field for you and present that back to you. That's a, that's like a new way of doing like fuzzy search for the most important thing on a page. Because then like if you pull all the text out, all the text is not useful. OCR is great, but it's not great for disambiguating information. You're saying now you can give it hints on, I want this kind of information and then it can give you that in return as well. 
Absolutely. I love the fact that you called it fuzzy search for documents. This is this is amazing. So so I, I, I probably have to use that next time. I talk mm, to see, I'm, this is why I make the medium to small dollars. Any other cool things <laughs> before we go to the demo? Oh yeah, there's absolutely there's there's a lot more. I can I can I can I can talk to you about uh, new pre-built models. We've got a new pre-built model for a 1098 form, which is you know we're all heading up into tax season Absolutely. now, so there's there's things that that you need to to worry about. Uh, the 1098 form has a few different variants. There's a 1098 mortgage form. There's 1098 student loan. There's 1098 uh, uh, for uh, you know for tuition and loan payments and things like that. So, so there's a c- couple of different variations of the 1098 form that are all supported. Uh, in addition to that, we have a lot more updates in terms of like uh, model quality improvements, uh, language coverage, uh, custom neural models, for example. Uh, we've now included uh, a, a number of Latin languages. So that would be German, Dutch, Italian, French, and Spanish uh, as as languages that you can train documents with for custom neural models. There's signature detection improvements in custom template models. Uh, there's uh, AI quality improvements across the board, both in uh, layout in terms of uh, the the table extraction as well as OCR improvements for like single character digits. So there's a ton of things I can, I can talk about, but maybe we stop there. And I'll, I'll it let you feels ask like what you're telling me, Vinod, is you should come on more often because it feels like there's a backlog of good stuff. All right, can we jump in and see some of these things in action? Absolutely, let's do that. So so I'll start with a quick demo. Uh, we'll, we'll maybe walk you through some of the, the updates as we go along, right? Okay, um, so the first place I'll, I'll point you to is the Form Recognizer Studio. Obviously, this is where you want to go to experience the best and greatest of Form Recognizer. Um, the things that I'll, I'll call out as you're doing this is uh, you, when you go into Form Recognizer for the first time, if you've never really used the tool before, uh, go ahead and create a, a resource in the Azure portal and then go ahead and set up that resource for you to use in the Form Recognizer Studio. Once you have that done, uh, I'll start maybe with, with the document classification capability. Uh, if for, for, for people who've seen the Form Recognizer Studio before and used it before, you've seen uh, sort of the custom model section. You'll notice now that, that we have two tiles here. There's the custom classification models as well. So we'll start with a quick demo on how you train a custom classification model, right? And my goal is to show you how you can do this in, in uh, two clicks or less once you get to the, the point where, you know, you've got your data that you're playing with. This is right? awesome. Can you control plus for me to make this the screen a little bit bigger? Oh, sure. Yeah. How's that? Nice. Perfect. Uh, so I'll go ahead and, and go ahead and uh, set up a new new project uh, to start with. We'll just call uh, call this the AI Show project, um, um, and I have to learn how to spell better. Um, then you and me the, both, my friend. The next thing we'll do is we need to select a, a resource we're, we're working with. So in this case, I'm going to select a resource that I've already provisioned. Uh, and the, the thing to to remember here is. Uh, all of these resources are need to be in um, um, the uh, in a in a few different regions, right? And I'll, I'll I'll talk to you a little bit about that as we go along because uh, within our with, with our current preview, we've only got the preview available for use in three specific regions, which is uh, West US two, East East US, and West Europe. Uh, so as long as you provision a resource in one of these three regions, you should be able to use most of the preview features. The OpenAI integration that I just talked about is only available in East US. So, so just just be aware that that is one of the the limitations of, of what you need to to remember. Got it. Um, so again, I'll, I'll go through this. Uh, at this point, I'm really just selecting both my form recognizer resource that I want to use, uh, as well as the um, uh, uh, you know the storage account that, that has my data. So, so what you're doing here. Is- let me, if I may, if what you're yeah. doing here is you're creating a custom classification model for documents, is that right? That is correct, right? So, uh, so what I've done so far is I've just uploaded a bunch of documents into a storage account, uh, and uh, I've organized these documents by folders, right? And so you'll see that uh, the first time you come in here, um, uh, it, the the model will ask you if you want to use uh, your your uh, the the, model, the 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 studio asks you if you want to use your folders as labels, right? And unfortunately, since I've already done this before, uh, it, it hasn't asked me that question, but it's actually pre-labeled these documents for me. But if you had just clicked on yes when when it asks you if you want to use your folders as labels, it goes ahead and labels all these documents for you. So you can see each of these documents has been labeled. There's a few contracts in here. There's a few POs in here. There's a few uh, statement to work, and there's some trade confirmations. These are just examples of some document types that that I, I chose to use for for this demo. Uh, 
That's cool. Uh, once I go ahead and hit train, you'll find that I can uh, I can call this the AI show model. Uh, and once I once I hit train, uh, it takes about a minute or so to train. Uh, while that uh, while that model is training, I already have a train model over here that I can I can go ahead and, and show you how how this might work. Right. So I'm going to do a, a, I'm going to test this with a file. And I, what I've done is I've, I've created a file uh, that uh, that has a, a few different uh, sort of documents contained within it. Right. So you'll see it's a six page doc mm -hmm. file that has a statement of work as sort of like a few pages of that. Uh, it has a purchase order and it has a um, trade confirmation, I guess, right? So once I go ahead and click analyze on this particular document, it's going to get analyzed with the model. Uh, it's 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 the model. It's a different model, but it's, it was trained on the same exact same data set. It's not the AI show model, but it's the demo model. And you'll see that the result will come back with uh, both the classification of the documents as well as the page range of each of these documents. And so that's that's essentially what you can then use to then push. Uh, if, if, for example, the statement of work was was something that I was interested in, uh, I could use that uh, that page range to send the statement of work section of this document to the statement of work model for analysis. That's right, so that's really cool. Like, and I and and I know you're like, th that's really cool because it's not just it's not just a single document thing. It's like everyone smushed this stuff together and that would have totally messed everybody up in the previous setting. But now you can separate these documents and then do further work based upon that stuff too. Absolutely. And, and, and it's not just recognizing that there's multiple documents uh, smushed together, right? It, it's also recognizing that there may be multiple instances of the same documents smushed together, right? So you might have like trade confirmation, you might have four pages of trade confirmations, but they're all one page documents. And so we'll be able to recognize that there's actually four instances of that same document so that's also some of the the capabilities within within the document classification model today that's so cool what, what else you got my friend all right so so we looked at uh, obviously so the uh, you know the if you look at the result it's telling you that we've got four pages of the sow a page of the po and a page of uh, trade confirmation so, that, so that's classification in a nutshell right so uh let's talk a little bit about uh some of the other capabilities as well and i'll start with um uh, with the um with the query fields, right? Um, so query fields is a gated feature. So, so if, if you want to use this, you obviously have to request access uh, and also make sure that the resource that you're using is an East US. So, so that's, those are the two limitations that you need to be aware of. Uh, so here's an example of, a, of uh, how I could use query fields, right? So uh, in this particular document, you can see that the, the general document model extracted a bunch of key value pairs, right? Uh, sure. But hypothetically, I may be interested in looking at something really specific, like uh, maybe what are the notes due uh, in 2028? Uh, and the other thing that I could be looking for is like, what is the total number of outstanding shares, right? So those would be maybe fields that I'm interested in, in, in ex extracting for this particular document. So I go into the query field section and I add these two fields in, right? So I say, uh, you know, I want the percent notes ex notes due in 2028, uh, which is what uh, th that area of the document might be. And then the number of shares outstanding, right? So those those are the two things that I'm really interested in. And once I once I go ahead and analyze the document with this with these two fields, you'll see that in addition to the key value pairs that were extracted as part of the the model, we now have the new output of query fields. And query fields is going to tell me, uh, you know, based on the the questions that I'm asking of this document, it's going to tell me that uh, the number of shares outstanding is this. Uh, the seven billion whatever number, uh, and the percent notes due on 2020 in 2028 is 3.125 five percent, which is essentially this this number back here. So again, that's the, the that's the capability of using your open AI to then extract this model based on the prompt that we're asking it for. And that's something that you can uh, you can send to the API as well. Do you have to use this this interface to do it? Is this APIable, so to speak? Oh, absolutely. So, so everything within Form Recognizer is essentially an API. Um, the studio is essentially just a, a demo that consumes that API. So, uh, so everything that I'm showing you here is completely automatable through the API. Uh, you know, this this is just essentially just a query string parameter that you add to the, the to the general document query to say that you want to use the premium query fields feature, and these are the fields that you want extracted as as part of that request. And that's a cool feature because if you're trying to look for specific things in documents and not just like 
like a f- text search, but a location. Because I'm, I'm, is it give you location on the page as well when you do that? It doesn't. It doesn't really give you location on the page as well because uh, essentially the, the model is just extracting these oh, values from, from the text, and so there's there's no location information being encoded as part of that that request. Uh, but that is something that that we continue to evaluate in terms of saying like how do we ground this better to 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 understand you know. Uh, what values are, are specifically being extracted and from which part of the document is it? But if that's a field that's generally being extracted, you could also look at the JSON and find where that field is too, ostensibly. Absolutely, right? So, so in uh, you know, like just like you mentioned, right? So if you look at the results uh, from from this particular request, right? Uh, you have obviously all the content. You have the content organized by pages, and you have the content organized by words as well as lines. Uh, but in addition to that, you you have uh, you know the, the core things that, that you'd expect to see from from uh, from the API, which is key value pairs, which is essentially uh, the output from the general document model, and then there's also the output within the document section of the model, uh, which contains the fields that that I just defined, which are both the shares outstanding as well as the percent of notes due in 2028. So, so that's you can sort of theory, you can in theory use your query fields to get the data you want, and then go to the response to find where it is too. Oh yes, yeah. So 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 to answer your question, yes, absolutely, right. So so I could go in here and I can search in the in the line section. I could search for uh, you know like if I were to search for uh, yeah, whatever twenty twenty eight maybe since uh, there, you could see that you know like it says that there's there's the the notes due in twenty twenty eight and here's the polygon for where that that is represented within the 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 span of text of this document. That that is amazing. We have time for just a couple of more features. Can you rapid fire show us a couple of cool things that you want to show us, and then uh, maybe we'll wrap it up. Absolutely. Let's 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 talk a little bit about the new uh, uh, pre-built models. Uh, in the in the pre-built models, we we now have a new pre-built model for the 1098 form. Uh, you know, uh, the the 1098 form is a typical tax form that most of us have to fill out uh, if you if you own a house, and and there's mortgage payments uh, that that you're dealing with. Uh, it also has a few different variants. You can see that there's a 1098E and there's a 1098T. Uh, so each of these are, are essentially models that, that you can now use within your um, within your document automation workflows. Uh, obviously, the, the 1098 form extracts both the, the year that, that this, this particular tax year that this particular document deals with and all the different fields that you need extracted as part of uh, sort of automation of this this tax form itself right so in conjunction with the the existing w2 model this might be something that you can start using as as as, as you know a tax processor or, or or somebody who's working with a lot of documents where uh say loans and, and things like that where, where it's financial services and, and this might be an example of how you can start using form recognizer capabilities to automate some of these document processing scenarios now is this a pdf or a, a picture uh, this is a. I believe this is a picture. So, so this might be a picture that 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 we're using, but it could also be a PDF, right? So, in this That's case, cool. it's a PNG. I think it's harder if it's a PNG. It's a PNG. It's a PNG. Yeah, I see it now there over over there to the left. It, it's almost harder to do with the, just a picture, which is which is really cool. Yeah, so so we're able to extract uh, uh, content from from both images, which is PNGs, TIFFs, and things like that, as well as uh, PDFs. So those are all sort of like supported formats within Form Recognizer. Amazing. And you mentioned something about language. Do you have anything to show us with language? Um, yeah, th- definitely. So, I mean, uh, some of the things that, that you might uh, be aware of is, uh, you know, you can obviously work with uh, receipts in different languages. Um, I don't know if I have a quick sample here that is a different language, but uh, uh, maybe here's here's one. This So, so obviously, we're able to extract uh, all the different fields that you typically extract from a receipt in receipts from, from different languages, right? So here's oh. a Spanish receipt, for example, that, that has uh, obviously the, the line items, uh, you know, who the merchant is, merchant address, as well as uh, some of the other fields like the totals and things like that. So so again, right, um, typically what, what we recommend is customers just ignore the, the, the language and just send us the document and, and we auto detect the language and, 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 and produce a response back. But you could also give us a hint by sending us a locale code or a language and locale code combination that says, you know, I'd like to see a Spanish response for, right. for, for this particular document. And the cool thing about these features is that they're, like, they're such low-hanging fruit of just features that will delight your customers in, in like such a nice way. Like, don't type in the stuff from your receipt. Take a picture of it and upload it, and that is sufficient for us, which is really cool. They're just little easy delighters that you can add to software literally right now. 
Absolutely, right? And and then, you know, the other thing is you're also seeing a lot of this go into uh, scenarios where, uh, you know, you might want to do expense reporting as an example, right? Like, so so why would you want to to go ahead and, and take all this uh, time to, to fill out, like, uh, you know, what was the tax, what was the, the rate and, and, and things like that? So this this is all something that you can just automate without having to do a lot of that that grunt work for yourself. All right. Well, any other things you want to you want to show us? Uh, obviously, there's, there's a lot more that I can talk about, but, uh, you know, like some of the uh, other core sort of capabilities that, that you can you can also look at if you look at the, the what's new section on the on the website. Uh, so the docs have a, an update that, that shows you what's new. Um, there's, uh, you know, like I mentioned earlier, there's language expansion for custom neural models. That's been something that a lot of customers have asked for. So, so if you want to train models in, in uh, different languages, that that's all that that capability exists now. That's amazing. Uh, this has been been awesome, my friend. Here's a couple of links, by the way, if you want to know what form, Azure Form Recognizer is, you can go to this link right here. And what was that software that you were showing us? What was, what is that thing called? Uh, the software that I was showing, like you. The, the the UI that you were showing us. What is that thing? That's the Form Recognizer Studio, right? So, so the Form Recognizer Studio is where you want to go and essentially try out every single one of Form Recognizer capabilities. Um, like some of the things that I didn't show you today, for example, barcodes, right? So Form Recognizer now has the ability for you to recognize barcodes. Uh, those would be things that that you could use. Uh, you know, we, we also do a lot of, we've also done a lot of work with things like, uh, you know, detecting formulas in documents. Now you can do that. Uh, you can do things like uh, recognizing annotations in documents. We also support high resolution documents. So, so there's a number of different updates that, that you should go check out if, you, if you're interested in, in, in exploring those. Well, this has been absolutely fantastic. For those, again, that want to know about Azure Form Recognizer, here's the link to go learn more on the documentation. And if you were excited by the tool that you just saw, Form Recognizer Studio, which Vinod has promised that is it's basically a wonderful skin over all API stuff that you can integrate into all of your software. This has been amazing, my friend. Thank you so much, Seth. Thanks for having me on and great to share the goodness of Form Recognizer. My pleasure. Thank you so much, uh, Vinod. And thank you so much for watching. We're learning all about the latest model updates in Azure Form Recognizer. Thank you so much for watching and hopefully we'll see you next time. Take care. You're not going to want to miss this episode. Oh, of the man. I made it go again. There's Cassie. And, Cassie, what do you think of that stuff? I always get excited about Form Recognizer, which is weird because you think document processing, generally people don't get excited about that. But I used to work at a law firm back in the day. And so there was a lot of obviously huge document processes. And I worked in the IT department. So just seeing how far things are coming and what you can accomplish with Form Recognizer is just huge for different like process, like automation and, and different like things that law firms need to do. There's tons of documents and, and it's not just legal, obviously this is in lots of ton of other stuff. Vinod, uh, uh, what's it like watching yourself, uh, in a video? Do you like that? No, I hate that. That's the worst part of it. Vinod and you're such a better looking guy than I am. And I had to watch tons of video <laughs> myself. People are just all around, just throwing up on themselves. Oh so, my gosh! No, you're a natural dude. I, I'm just, uh, I just try to, I just try to, try to get to set levels of uh, amazingness. Oh man, no! I think what it is is you just stop caring about certain things and just like mm -hmm. if you look stupid, yeah. you just look stupid, and it makes for a better show sometimes. So, for note, as you were watching, yeah. were there any other things that you were like, oh, I should have said this, or I should have brought this up, anything like that? Yeah, I mean, I mentioned some of the things towards the very end, like things like barcodes. I know there's a question in the chat about QR codes, so so that's yes, absolutely, that's supported. Uh, so so I think that there's two things that I would want to maybe call out, right? So as uh, I mentioned, uh, layout has now improved dramatically uh, with things like uh, we talked about barcodes, we talked about annotations, uh, we talked about formulas, and we talked about high resolution images, right? So if you think about all of those sorts of um, capabilities now layout becomes a really interesting way for you to essentially take the contents of your document uh and then you know like like Cassie mentioned about the law firm right so if you're if you're a law firm you want to do some some analysis on on, on contracts and things like that you can segment out your documents and do different things with it to, to identify like you know what are these different clauses mean what are the are these terms redlined or not and things like that those are all really cool capabilities that you can do with with, with this now and I, I mean, people are using this a lot. I mean, I've, I've, I've seen some numbers. It's this is, and I've been telling people like the AI that's the best is probably the most boring AI because it's like you don't want to do that stuff, right? Yeah. Are you seeing that too, Vinod? 
Absolutely, right? And you, if you think about it, right, there, there isn't an organization in the world that doesn't have documents to deal with, right? So so whether like you're a law firm, whether you're you're a, 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 a company like Microsoft, we all have documents, right? And so this is a common challenge for everybody. And I think the fact that we've taken this approach to actually apply this AI problem on a specific set of challenges, I think that's what makes it really interesting and useful for, for customers because now they have a really defined use case and we have a defined solution that targets that use case. I love it. All right. So there was a, let's see, uh, Chris, Chris, maybe he was talking about me. Let's see what he said. Are you not, are you not mess, missing the point uh, with this technology? You could vectorize and semantically search whatever size database you want. Could you remind us of the vector search stuff that, because we did talk about that briefly, didn't we? Um, yeah, the vector search stuff is, is part of semantic, uh, uh, cognitive search, right? So, so right. cognitive search is essentially where you want to take your documents and then apply a search on it, right? The distinction between what we do versus what cognitive search does, for example, today is we work on a single document at a time, right? So we're not necessarily uh, in this in this mode where we can take a corpus of documents and then apply some some enrichments or, or, or things to it, right? And that's all sort of capabilities that, that are contained within cognitive search. Uh, with Inform Recognizer, we essentially work, we're, we're a simple API, we, we do request response today. And so uh, you send us a document, we do our best to extract the things that you ask us to work on, and, and we produce those results, right? Uh, taking those results and then applying sort of the, uh, the, <clears throat> the different elements of search, right? Whether that be relevance ranking through vectors or relevance ranking through any other algorithm, like, like you know, there, there's tons of those, BM25 and other things that, that, that are used. Those are all sort of core uh, search workloads. That's cool. So as a skill in cognitive search, you can inject form recognizer to put that stuff into the index. And you can even you can even vectorize some of the text, you know, for embeddings and such. So maybe I maybe I did miss the point, Chris, initially, but I think now we've all got it. Cassie, any observations from you or things you would like to ask Renaud about form recognizer? Well, yeah, no, I was just gonna say the multi-model thing is really important because like I feel like if you think about, you know, the right tool, right job form recognizer is really about extracting and labeling information, right? Like that's what we're the kind of the big picture is and getting better quality data from our documents, which we can then add additional tooling on to make decisions. So um, I think it was a really good uh, observation that you could add cognitive search on top of that, like a different tool. And I think when I've used Film Recognizer, I've always used it as part of my process, like get my information and then make decisions based on it. That's cool. Uh, and then there was some Azure OpenAI stuff that we added too. Vinod, do you want to summarize that <laughs> stuff again? Because that, that was, that's yeah. the, I think I, I think I went too fast there. And I was after I was like, oh, maybe we should have spent more time. And that's why we're here because, to fix mistakes. But no, tell us more about that. Yeah. So, so we're using Azure OpenAI uh, as a way for you to give us uh, sort of a hint on things that you might know are contained within those documents that you're looking to extract. So the general document model, for example, is where we're starting. And the general document model is a pre-trained model that extracts key value pairs from any document, right? Uh, but there may be things that the model is not really catching because it's described either in the text or it's it's in a in a paragraph that, that the model doesn't really understand that it has a, a specific key value pair sort of notation to it. Right. But you might know, like, like think about a doctor's visit, right? So the doctor's visit, you know, it has a date, it has a patient name and all those sorts of things as key value pairs. But within the doctor's notes, you might have some things about a diagnosis as an example. Uh, so now you might want to extract, uh, say, what are the ICD codes that the doctor has mentioned, right? So so, um, so that might be something that you can use uh, the, uh, the open AI capabilities to essentially read in the content and then extract those particular fields that you're interested in, right? So, so maybe in the doctor's notes where you're looking for maybe a diagnosis to say like, you know, what is the what is the specific thing that this doctor is recommending that I do? Oh, so I it's like more fuzzy, that. right? It's like squishier in exactly. terms of this. And, and Cassie, you were going to say something? I was, was curious, how does that like work in the process? Is that something when I upload the documents I ask or how, when do I ask it that information or give it that context? Yeah, so it's it's essentially when you upload the document. So as part of the okay. request, you're you're sending a request into the general document model. In addition to the to 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 the document, you also specify a query string that tells us what are the specific fields that you're interested in, right? Mm -hmm. And so you you know there's all this talk in in, in the internet about uh, you know prompt generation for 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 these large language models, and essentially you're giving us a prompt. You're telling us like this is the the field that I'm interested in, and that prompt is essentially what we generate uh, a response for using the OpenAI model. Uh, to then produce a response that is sort of the aggregation of what the general document model produces as well as the open ai model produced for us 
That's so awesome. you're you're basically sending it a prompt and the text of what's in there OCR ish, right? Exactly, right. So oh. we're taking the output of OCR and generating the 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 response based on the prompts that you've supplied. That's pretty cool. That is so pretty cool. cool. I know. I'm just sitting here like we're all like nerding out over like your your TPA or documents. <laughs> <laughs> Monday morning, nerding out on documents. That's awesome. That's like, <laughs> Your TPA, I don't even know what that is. I know, there's like a movie, right? Where there's like a TPA report they got to fill out. Oh, yes. The Office Space. Office right? Space. Yes. Yes. I don't think I've ever seen that movie, but I know about oh TPA God. report. So basically, yeah. Monday morning TPA reports are yeah. done away with with a single <laughs> API call. Exactly. And information right. so extraction. With we're we're going to have we're gonna have to find the next, next new thing to be, uh, you know, burdensome, I guess. <laughs> And that's the thing about AI. I have yeah. found that the most useful artificial intelligence, specifically machine learning, is the stuff that takes away the part of the job that's just completely not fun. Yeah. Uh, the and the thing that, yeah. systematic tasks that we have to do. Yeah. And the other thing is that this one actually recognizes handwriting too, right? Yes. Yes. And, and yeah, it, it's not just handwriting. It's also like, you know, like like with the annotations, for example, right? Like now now you can, uh, you know, for example, you might you might underline something in a, in a in a document. And so you're now recognizing that as well. So it's it's in addition to handwriting, you can also start doing things that are like, OK, you know, um, like a lawyer maybe redline something and said like, hey, we want to re renegotiate these terms of the contract and, and mm. they, they underline something. Now, now you know what parts of the document you need to sort of work on as well as, as part of that's cool. I mean, I I think it's great. I'm excited about it. Uh, for those that want to try it out, uh, you can find out what's new with Azure Form Recognizer here at this fantastic link, aka.ms forward slash. I'm so old, I can't read it. It's too small. That's form Recognizer forward slash docs, and then Form Recognizer Studio is here. Abby, aka.ms Form Recognizer, get started. So make sure you take a look at those uh, so that you can... Uh, get to form recognizing and to finish up we're just going to say it's time to as janice q number seven says let's get forms to recognize <laughs> that's the tagline i love it <laughs> let's like we should make new t-shirts out of that Vinod. let's get some forms to recognize <laughs> you better recognize this form okay. that's right i'm pretty excited about that all right Vinod, thanks so much for being with us buddy all right thank you all right we'll see you buddy. Thanks, bye. How about them apples, Cassie? I recognize. <laughs> I recognize that this is some awesome tech. Right? That if you are if you are doing anything with papers and forms, you should probably stop and just mm -hmm. call the API. I wonder how much it costs. I that, because it, that's the one thing. So let me remove this. Let me go back to my screen here. Uh, boom, boom. Okay, let's go look at Azure Form Recognizer cost. Azure Form Recognizer pricing. Look at that. Thank you. <laughs> Let's just ask the chat GPT. How much does Azure, uh, Bing chat, sorry, Azure form recognizer cost? You know, when you had to make your, your screen or when you're talking about the text, I literally just recently had to like up my base like percentage on my screen to like be larger because I felt like I was squinting all the time. And it's yes. like, oh, yep, I am also that old. No, no, Cassie. No, it's not true. It's true. Because if you're old, then I'm ancient. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here we go. Azure, for, uh, Azure, according to Microsoft Azure, the pricing for Form Recognizer is based on the type of agreement entered with Microsoft and data purchase. You can sign in Azure Pricing Calculator to see what the pricing is. You can also contact it. Blah, 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 blah. Okay, so where's the pricing calculator? Let's go to the calculator. I just realized our face was in the way in the chat. Mm -hmm. Microsoft is conducting an online survey. Yeah, I would love to participate. Let's do it. Yeah. I think we have another question. Oh, what is it? Um, do you want to? Yeah, there we go. What does it say? Uh, oh, let me move it over here. Here, sorry, I can't move it in front of my screen. Can this work through large reports with HR and payroll data? Also, are there still limitations of records that have interrupting page breaks? No, and that's what he said. Yeah. But note, are you still there? Oh, he is. Wait, he's still here. He's still here. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Let me uh, here, you're back. You're back. Yes. This, this, do you have an answer to this question? Can you uh, HR payroll data that are still limitations? Uh, yeah, so absolutely. So we talked a little bit about the document classification feature. We right? did. Yeah. So so 
with the document classification feature, you actually get classification and splitting. So it's not just a classification, but it's actually classifying uh, multiple documents within the same file. So for example, in this particular scenario, if you've got page breaks where, you know, there's multiple, uh, multiple documents sort of uh, collated together into a single PDF file, you can now identify what are those page ranges that constitute document one versus document two, and then apply that to, to your analysis or your extraction process then. That's it breaks up pages based upon document type, right? Yeah. And that's new. And that's one of the new things, uh, Vast CNC, that you can enjoy today. Well, is it today? Is it out already? Look it is that. out already, yes. Oh, so, see? So, so it, is, it, is, mm. it is in public preview today, yes. Mm. I, all I can say about that is yeah. thank you, uh, Vinod, for, for coming back and answering this, this wonderful question that mm. I just didn't even... Oh, I just kicked you out. Sorry. That was the wrong button, Vinod. Sorry, buddy. I didn't mean to kick you out. So I'm so ready to get kicked out. I'm good. <laughs> sorry. This is not the kind of show we usually run, Vinod. I'm so sorry. I, I love when I get to see things, and that means I can go use them right now because I'm, like, impatient. And so seeing it's, like, it's here now. It's not like you have to wait a month or something like that. You can go That's, play with this and try your scenario and see, you know, exactly what you can create. So By the way, I know I said this isn't the kind of show we run, but Vinod's been on this, like, what, your third, fourth time? This is my third or fourth time, you're right. He, he, he show, knows it. He's like, no, mm -hmm. this is exactly the kind of show yeah. that you run. <laughs> All right, bud, thanks for answering that last question. We'll see you. Absolutely, my pleasure. All right, bye. All right, Cassie, uh, we have a show coming up, not next week, um, mm -hmm. but when is it? I think it's still TBD, but we can still, we can uh, talk well, about let's, it. Let's tease it just a hair and then I'll talk about what we're doing next week. Hold on. Okay. I got to, I got to get the, I got to get the new, we got a new, um, a new card for this one. So let me load it up here live. So while we're going uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, we did a thing. Why don't you remind people mm -hmm. what that was? Yeah. So I had been working on if I could get uh, the stable diffusion text um, to image models to work for inferencing in C sharp oh, yes, um, right. leveraging Onyx runtime. Yeah. So if we did a holiday show. We did part one and I was in the middle of it. So usually when I build something, I wait till I figure out all the kinks <laughs> and then I show it, you know, but that's not the but kind of show like, we run, Cassie. <laughs> yeah. I was like, let's just show it when it's broken and show where we're at. So we kind of looked at like fundamentally how stable diffusion is working, the processes and all of that. Um, and then we kind of got to where I was at at that point in development. So we're going to do a part two because it works now and it's actually available. You can go play with it now um, on my GitHub, but uh, we're going to walk through it, the rest of it and uh, see how it works and play around with it. It's really fun to play with stable diffusion if you haven't played with stable diffusion and this runs locally and it's just going to use your local GPU. Um, you want to make sure you have a decent one. I tested it on a 3070. I think it will also work on a 3060. I think you just need a 30 series to be honest, but I I haven't tested anything smaller than that. So I uh, I um, recently, did I tell you I got a new I got a new uh, here here let me show you let me let me go to my screen here I got a new GPU did I tell you this Yes we talked we I think we talked about it on the the show and I was very jealous Boom! I'm very excited oh. envious Boom! of that So, so I, went to, yeah. I went to a Best Buy it was the saddest thing I want to hear what you have to say I went to a Best Buy I ordered it. And I had to show up at the Best Buy and pick it up. There was like nobody there. Because people don't go to like the store anymore. Is that why? There's a, but I bet they're, um, I went there recently and their online order pickup, there was tons of stuff there to pick up. Oh yeah. That's what I did. And it yeah. was totally full uh, of mm -hmm. stuff. So Best Buy is awesome. It is my childhood famous memory of, like, of that. Yeah. Going there and getting CDs. Yes. Going there and getting anything. <laughs> uh so um all right so you were you were saying cassie about gpus oh yeah also funny i don't know if you know this but uh best buy is minnesota based it's minnesota really team. it is yeah don't you know don't you know <laughs> now you know i know that doesn't creep over because are you you're in you're in minneapolis or you're in uh what uh yeah i'm just like 20 minutes outside of minneapolis yeah yeah, yeah. Minnesota. Um, minnesota but you don't have that that uh cool accent can I just say that it is very characterized in most media. And so there are some people that have it more thick, but in general, this is what we sound like. And if I say certain words, it comes out and you can hear it like it's there subtly, but it's not nearly as thick as it, it is the way that I would say Hollywood portrays our accent, accent in general. 
I'm I'm just like I'm just feeding into stereotypes. It's, I'm a terrible person, Cassie. I'm so sorry. We we laugh about it. We like it. We do say you betcha though. Like that's definitely a thing. Um, there's there's definitely a, like some truth to some of the phrases and things that we say. Uh, but but the accent is definitely over um, overplayed. Yeah, overproduced. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, it turns out also, Cassie, I have on my calendar here. Um, it says that we're making a show after this. What is the AI show? Why don't we just do it here? <laughs> wait, wait, the stable diffusion one? No, what no, one? no. It says it says record. What is the AI show video podcast? Uh -huh. Like literally, it's happening in yeah. like four minutes. Because we are going to be uh, a podcast now too. What? I know. So cool. Tell everybody. Tell tell everybody. What are we doing? Well, we are going to take the amazing content that Seth and team and that I've been lucky enough to participate in help you and, support. You and I both get to do, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and we're going to be putting it out on Spotify as a podcast. And I believe Apple platform as well. I don't know exactly which platforms. I have to double check that. But for sure, Spotify and I think Apple uh, because they support video podcasts as well. So I don't know if anyone out there like has any favorite podcasts that they listen to. Um, but I have a lot that I like to watch that are also video and audio. So there's going to be multiple ways to enjoy the AI show and to enjoy shows you may have missed. Yeah. And we had one of our friends in marketing was like, Hey, have you thought of doing this? And we're like, we don't know anything. <laughs> we just, we just make shows and uh, we, you tell us what to do. And so that's what's going on. So we have to record a, what is the AI show? So sh should we do one here? How long I is guess. it? How, how long I mean, is what it? Is it? To... Can you let me know? <laughs> I don't. I'm looking at this thing. It's like it's you, yeah. telling me to do something. It's empty. Of course, it's empty. We're you, Cassie and I are like the same person. <laughs> we're like remind ourselves to do something by putting something on the calendar, and then we like what is this? <laughs> Record what is the AI show video podcast? Maybe yeah. we should talk about what we like for those that are watching it a little bit. <laughs> For those that are watching, I know there's a 30 second delay. What would you say the AI show is? Oh, I love that. Yeah. yeah. What would you say the AI show is? So there's about 30 seconds. I, I, I don't know. I think the AI show is we talk about cool tech that Microsoft puts out and others. Like I've had other people yeah. come on and show other tech from other companies. I mean, in fact, I reached out because I, I'm really I'm a huge fan of, of Chip Nguyen. Uh, who put out a cool book and I don't have it right here, but it's a, it's about ML ops. And I just went into their, into their discord. I'm like, Hey, does anyone have any cool AI things they'd like to show? And that's someone came on and that's what we, we showed. Uh, I think it was a uh, voice flow is what it was called, which is cool. cool. And so if you want to come on, I mean, we're, we're happy to have you on. And if you have something to say about AI, we'd love to, to hear it too. So I think it's just a, it's a show about AI. What's new, what's cool, what's happening. What do you think, uh, Cassie? Yeah, I think it's about that. I think it's about cool new tools that help enable us to do our jobs, right? And to um, just enable getting things done. And I think that, we, you know, we highlight open source products and we, you know, we've had Intel and Hugging Face and all kinds of people doing just really cool stuff in the AI community. So I think of it as kind of like the heartbeat of what's happening in AI. Yeah. That's our new tag tagline. Is that good? <laughs> the, hold on, hold on. Let me, let's make it official. Let's make it, hold on, hold on. Oh, that's the wrong button. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> that was semi on purpose. <laughs> Maybe me, how some people feel about it, but that's not how people feel about it. The AI show. The heartbeat of what's happening in AI. Hold on, this is where we would have like a field, like like a field. The heartbeat of what's happening in AI. Yeah. And you can too. Mm -hmm. That's it. Yes. Oh my gosh, that was so dumb. I pushed the screen. <laughs> Surprisingly, there's still people here. So <laughs> uh, it's good stuff. Uh, but yeah, this show is all about what's happening in AI, how to make sense of it. We go from as high to uh, from as high as uh no code development or participation in AI all the way down to what we were looking at architecture of YOLO V9 with how we would include it in a classification problem. And we were discussing whether or not it's overshooting. And that was all in the single show. We've done mm -hmm. stuff like that. And and you get to ask questions. So that's the other thing is I think I love the way that people ask questions to which allows it accessible like to be more accessible to lots of different types of people. Um, because we get questions from all broad spectrums of uh level of expertise. And so I think we also try to kind of distill things and make them accessible and understandable too for no matter where you are in your AI journey. 
Correct. Correct. And I, I got to start playing my, my walk-off music because apparently it's already it's already past time. But but if you think about it, the AI show, that's what it is. It's just to help you get bearings. And, and I pretend I don't know what I'm talking about sometimes. We don't ever let Cassie do that. She always knows what she's talking about. <laughs> Uh, but uh, I come at it from an academic perspective. Did I tell y'all how I met Cassie? I think I told. We I'll, I'll talk tell about you. It. Well, t- Inception story. Here we go. Inception okay. story with the background music. I was at a conference. Was it that conference or mm-hmm. was it Code Man? It was that. Okay, that conference. Uh, it's a beautiful conference in the Wisconsin Dells. In fact, you should go go sign up. Um, uh, they're having it again this year. It's delightful. Uh, and I gave an AI talk, and I get all the dudes are like aren't you worried about AI robots killing you? And I'm just like, that's a really good question, sir. In my head. Ah! That's what I'm thinking. Ah! That's where the scream comes in. That's yeah. where the scream. Co- oh, that's what I was thinking in my head. Like, yeah. but I was not, no, sir. I'm not. And then Cassie's like, I think you asked me about learning rate back off. Yeah, something. I was, I was learning and I was having issues with uh, deployment and um, it was before MLOps was really a thing, you know, like it, we, I was still, I was trying to figure out how to do MLOps before MLOps was around and I was trying to like deploy um, a model and I was like telling you basically every way that I had tried to do it, um, but I wasn't getting what I needed. And so, yeah. And so I was like, oh, an actual question. And I'm like, where did you study? And she's like, I figured it out in two weeks. And I'm like, that's like 10 years of college for me, girl. The internet. I learned it from Amazing. The uh, and I was so impressed. So we hired you. So uh, we come at it from both ends. Um, and I, I love, I love yeah. the, but there's also like, and she knows almost exactly the, as much as I do. It, it, we're, I mean, obviously there's some areas where she knows a little bit more and I, some areas where I know a little bit more because we're basically the same. And so we come at it from every perspective. If you're trying to learn AI for the first time, Mm-hmm. Uh, there's tremendous perspective that, that Cassie has. Uh, if you want to know um, how some of the math works, she also has tremendous perspective. I don't know what I'm doing here, basically, is what I'm saying. And so that's what this show is all about, getting people started uh, with AI. Anything to add? Final words from you, Cassie? Yeah, I think it's that. And also not being like afraid to just try and, and learn because everybody was a beginner at some point. And so I think just having that inspirational like moment of, oh, I can do this. And at whatever level I feel comfortable. And there's a lot more people now that are going from traditional development like I was doing into an AI space or even like just applied AI and staying within that. But, you know, just expanding on your skill set. And I think that's one thing that is really cool about the show as well as it, it kind of brings all those things together and you can be applied AI. You can go into the math, but you don't necessarily have to, you can, no. you know, take what works for you. I think the math is fun, but only mm. because I don't know. I like being smart sometimes, maybe more, more smart Alec than smart. I remember because I, when I went to school, I came from Mexico because I lived in Mexico as a kid and I moved to New York and they kept calling me a smart Alec. And I was like, who's Alex? <laughs> Why is he so smart? <laughs> Who is he? I mean, what? thank you. You're, so you're like, I mean, thank you. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> but my name's not Alex. <laughs> language, language problems. All right. So as we get ready to go, I think that's a great introduction to the AI show. We might need to record this again, but it's a good, it's a good start. Good start. Next time on the AI show, we have a chat with Marco Casalena, VP in Azure AI platform and on Azure Open AI so make sure you show up next week. We will we will send some reminders. But he he runs the group that does all the cognitive services, the PM oh, wow. on the PM side, and he, he has a partner engineering team as well. And so you can ask him all about the Azure Open AI. We recently released the Chat GPT. I think it's called a uh, 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 Text GPT Turbo Turbo 3.5 Turbo. <laughs> I, I don't know. It feels like I needed to say it that way. And so you can ask him all those oh, questions God. next week on the AI show. Thank you so much for being with us, Cassie. Thanks for hanging out. Yep, thank you. All right. And we'll see you next time on the AI show. Thanks for watching. And hopefully we'll see you next time. Take care. Thank you.
Thank <laughs> you.